The following episode of True Crime Conversations contains discussions of violence, assault and the recounting of traumatic events. Listener discretion is advised. November 1994 and Jan Balmain is standing on the platform of Newcastle Station, her head craning to find the incoming train in the distance. She's looking forward to the arrival of her 22-year-old daughter, Ravel, who planned to catch the train from Sydney. The journey would have taken her about two and a half hours. Ravel lives in the affluent harbourside suburb of Bellevue Hill, a short commute from the city centre. Her mother knows she is a model and a dancer, exceptionally beautiful, with blue eyes, platinum blonde hair, tall and thin. Ravel is visiting her just before she leaves for her trip to Japan, where she will perform on her fourth cabaret tour. But there is a lot Jan doesn't know about her daughter. And on that November afternoon, Ravel will not get off that train in Newcastle. Traces of her life are strewn along the streets of Bellevue Hill, including the passport that was meant to get her to Japan. A trip that ultimately she never got to take. I'm Jessie Stevens and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. In this episode, I'm speaking with Caroline Overington about the disappearance of Ravel Balmain. Caroline is an award-winning journalist and author. She investigated the disappearance of Ravel Balmain for the Good Weekend magazine in 1999. Her voice might be familiar from her podcast for the Australian Nowhere Child. Let's begin in November 1994 when a woman named Jan Balmain is standing on the platform at Newcastle Station and she's waiting for the train from Sydney to arrive with her daughter um, Ravel on board. What happens? It's one of those cases where you can kind of put yourself into the shoes of Jan Balmain. She's a mum and Ravel is her much adored daughter. They have a really close relationship. Ravel has been a beautiful and bubbly little girl all her life. She's still only 22 years old. She's independent. She's living in Sydney and she's just about to leave Australia to go to Japan for a six-week holiday, a working holiday. I mean, some of your listeners will remember this. I don't know how often it happens anymore, but in the 90s, it was not uncommon for beautiful Australian girls to go to Japan and work as dancers. It was a really common thing to do. And I know that some people think, oh, well, if you're working as a dancer, what was it, like a topless dancer or were you actually working as an escort? But it was kind of common to go to Japan and they had these clubs for gentlemen, for Japanese businessmen really, who really wanted to see beautiful Australian girls in particular serving them their drinks and doting on them. And the girls could earn really good money, especially in terms of tips. And Ravel was gorgeous. She'd been a dancer all her life since she was a little girl and she was going to go and do this for six weeks. But before she left, she was going to have lunch with her mum on the New South Wales Central Coast. So Jan, who is the mum, was standing on the train station waiting for Ravel to get off the train and she doesn't she doesn't get off. She isn't on there. And it's really out of character. So Jan thinks to herself, well, maybe she's on the next train. Maybe she missed that one and she'll be on the next train. So she waits for the next train and Ravel still doesn't get off. And there's a lot that Jan didn't know about her daughter at the time and and what sort of life she was living. What was Ravel doing in Sydney? Well, she was, look, I find it really, really interesting that Ravel made choices that in the minds of some people were the wrong choices. And because of that, there are some people who who immediately jump to the conclusion that what happened to her, somehow you could have predicted it or somehow, you know, some people will even say, 
Well, that's not surprising that what happened to her happened to her because of the work that she was doing in Sydney. But to my mind, Ravel was just a young woman who had made some poor choices and she had been working as an escort in Sydney. And I know that that means that some people think, well, okay, well, then she'd put herself in the path of danger. But I very, very strongly object to that because it doesn't matter to me whether you're engaged in sex work or not. Violence against women is is a plague in Australia. And I think that women who work in sex work sometimes know violence in a way that the rest of us don't, or they experience a lot more violence than the rest of us do. But it is an important part of the story and we do have to discuss it because it is true that Jan didn't know that Ravel had been taking money for sex in Sydney, that she had been working for an escort, as an escort, and that that fact would come out in the public inquiry. So it's not something that people are running around speaking out of school, as it were. It did come up as a very important part of the inquiry into her disappearance, that she had been working as an escort. I want to look at the day before she disappeared and she met with a friend from school named Kate. What does she remember about Ravel from that day, about the conversations they had or what she looked like? Well, Ravel was at the peak of her beauty. There is no question about that. She had been working as a part-time model. The photographs of her are just astoundingly beautiful. And she had recently landed the cover of a magazine called Oyster. I'm not sure that Oyster exists anymore. I'd have to check that. But I, I remember in the 90s, it was like such a trendy magazine. It was like The Face, which is another magazine that doesn't exist anymore. But there were some really high class magazines around that were really strong on photography. And um, Ravel had landed a, a portrait of herself on the cover. She was an incredibly beautiful girl. And she was really looking forward to her future. She was thinking about the different ways that she might be able to establish herself and and it's true that she had been making some money on the side by working as an escort which is not an unusual choice for some women at that time well it is an unusual choice that's not fair it is an unusual choice but um it, it wasn't what she wanted to do with her life if you see what I mean that's how she was making her money um or making some money but she really hoped to make a go of it and she was feeling really optimistic she was feeling excited about the trip to Japan. She was really looking forward to seeing her mum. We wouldn't find this out till much later, but she'd also met a boy. She was really um, quite smitten with a boy. So things were heading in the right direction for Ravel. And the following day, she had a few clients lined up, didn't she? So the 5th of November 1994 is really the last day that we have um, a strong set of clues as to Ravel's last movements. She had been doing some work for an agency called Select Companions, which offered escorts in Sydney, and they had some appointments for her. Now, one of those appointments was at four o'clock in the afternoon, and then she had a later appointment at 7.30 that evening. And this is what we know. We know that she went to the four o'clock appointment and the procedure that was in place then was that the girls would arrive at the house, they would go to private houses. This is really rare now because of reasons of safety. But in those days, it was quite common the girl would arrive at the appointment and they would call the agency. So she called Select Companions and she said, I've arrived, I'm here. And that's their way of being able to say to the employer, I feel safe in this situation, I'm here, it's exactly how it's supposed to be because in those days of course there were no mobile phones either so you had you had no way of tracking where your employees were. We're talking about a very different time and a very different Australia. I mean Ravel had a pager so she could get messages on a pager. Now that's almost unheard of now but that was the way things were done then. We know that she got to the appointment at four o'clock and the other part of the procedure was that you would call when you were finished your appointment to let them know that you were leaving. And we know that she did call at 5.50pm, so she was there for about an hour and a bit, and she did call select companions at 5.50 to say that she was done and that she was leaving. And so that was normally the girl's way of letting the employer know that she was still safe, that the job was complete, and that she would now be leaving the premises. And so it's another mechanism to keep the girl safe, if you will. Now, we would later discover, much, much later, we would discover that the client that she was with says that she did not, in fact, intend to leave at that time. 
that what she had in fact intended to do was to call the agency and say, I finished my job here, but then she was going to stay. She was going to enter in what was known as a moonlighting or a private agreement with him to stay for longer. And there are reasons why girls might do that. So let's say, for example, you go along to your appointment at four o'clock and it's for two hours and you earn a certain amount of money for that and the agency takes its cut. But you might, in some examples, say to your client, I'll stay an extra hour and then you can put all that money in your pocket. Now, it's a breach of your employment conditions because obviously the agency doesn't want you to be going and earning money on the side and that's why it was called moonlighting. But that's what her client says that she did. Before we jump to what he says happened next, we know that she did make one other call at 7.15 that night. So she's gone to the appointment at 4. Close to 6, she's called the agency to say that I finished and I'm leaving. And then at about 7.15, she speaks to the same friend she spoke to the day before on the phone. And she just says, I can't talk now, that kind of thing. And the friend took that to mean that she was still with a client because that's how she would sometimes say, I can't talk now, and that would give the friend an idea, oh, okay, she's obviously busy with a client or busy doing something. Now, the client says that she actually stayed with him until about 8 p.m. on that day and that he then dropped her off at a place called the Red Tomato Inn. any witnesses when police were able to sort of follow this up who saw her or could corroborate that series of events? Well, we can certainly corroborate the phone calls. We know for a fact that she went to that appointment. We know the name of that man. His name was Gavin Owen Samer. We know that because he was a witness at the coronial inquiry and he told the coroner that he had booked Ravel, that he had booked a prostitute for that day and that Ravel had turned up. And he told the coroner that he was aware that she had made the phone call at close to six o'clock to say that she was leaving when in fact she was going to be staying longer. We know that she made the call to the friend at 7.15. We know that for sure. Now, as to whether or not Gavin dropped her at the Red Tomato Inn, police have said that they're not sure about that. They haven't been able to find anybody to say, oh, yes, I saw Ravel being dropped off at this particular pub and in fact one policeman said to me at the time that he didn't think that that was very likely that Ravel had ever gone into that pub and the reason he said that was because she was an incredibly beautiful woman. She was five foot eight, she had platinum hair, she looked like a model and that particular hotel attracted a very different kind of clientele and he said to me if a woman like that walked into that hotel the whole place would have stopped and everybody would have noticed. So he doubted that she ever went into that hotel. Now, we don't know whether she did or not. We know that Gavin Samer says she did and that he dropped her there, but we haven't been able to find anybody else to corroborate that. And Samer had a de facto partner who was away at the time. She would later tell police that she'd noticed a few things in the day's afterwards when she sort of returned home what what did she notice yeah gavin did have a girlfriend her name was michelle and she was away on that day on the day that uh, raval ultimately went missing and that and she was certainly away when he had raval at his house hiring her as a as a prostitute we would later discover that he had in fact hocked her clarinet hocked michelle's clarinet to pay for the sex with raval She tried a couple of times to reach Gavin that night by phone and he didn't pick up. She didn't reach him until about 20 minutes past nine. Now, that was not necessarily unusual. He wasn't great about picking up the phone, Um, but it is a fact worth noting that she wasn't able to get her boyfriend to pick up. Gavin Samer obviously became a person of interest. Now, that doesn't mean he's guilty of the crime. We don't use the word suspect anymore. It's just that he was the last person that we know saw Ravel alive and therefore he becomes somebody that the police want to rule out. 
So when they went and spoke to his girlfriend, they said, did you notice anything unusual? And she said two things. She said he was an incredibly lazy person, a very lazy boyfriend, an unhelpful boyfriend around the house, not unusual. And she had noticed that he had washed his sheets and hung them out on the line. And she took note of that. And again, it doesn't mean that he's guilty. It was just something that was unusual at the time. And the other thing she noticed was that he had the seats in the back of his car were down. She told the police about that as well. Now, he had a perfectly good explanation for that. Gavin was a very keen surfer. He's a broken down man now. But in those days, he was a 26-year-old, very keen surfer, Sydney sort of surfer dude. And it wasn't unusual for him to put the seats of his car down because he would sometimes carry boards. But those were the two things that she mentioned as being out of character or unusual. And there was a rumour that circulated about Ravel in the aftermath of her death regarding the owners of the brothel that she worked at. What was that rumour? That's right. The fact that um, Ravel was in the sex industry was very interesting to the police because we know that women who work in the sex industry or, or who do sex work are much more likely to be assaulted and indeed murdered. And for a very long time too, I think it's fair to say that the the deaths and the assaults on these women were not taken as seriously as they should be because people thought you were putting yourself in harm's way. And also there were moral judgments made, but nobody deserves to be assaulted and nobody deserves to be killed. And you can, as a young woman, make bad decisions and you still don't deserve to be treated in a violent way. I mean, I think that's a really important thing to say. One of the reasons I feel that Ravel's murder has perhaps not been solved is because moral judgments have been made about choices she made when she was a very young woman. One thing that police did look at was whether or not she could have been the victim of some kind of kidnapping or some kind of extortion or even murder as a result of the job that she was doing. And one rumour that went around was that an Arab prince had taken her back to Saudi Arabia. Now, I mean, that may sound fanciful now, but, well, in fact, maybe it wouldn't now because we do know for a fact because of the whole Jeffrey Epstein case, which was around the same time in the mid-90s, that young women were being pimped out to Arab princes in the Middle East. And we know that Jeffrey Epstein who committed suicide in a, in a US prison, what, two months ago, was involved in the 1990s in the wholesale abduction of young women. He was um, accused of recruiting young women for prostitution. He was re- accused of, of enslaving them aboard private planes and private yachts and making them available to rich men. This is not something that's completely fanciful, if you see what I mean. At the time, people thought, oh, could that be true? Would she really be kidnapped and taken taken away to be used as a sex slave. Well, we actually know that that did happen. Is it likely in this case? Probably not. That's probably not what happened. But that was one thing that went around at the time. And part of the reason that went around was because one of her clients was overheard in a pub one night telling a friend of his, she was um, involved in all kinds of moonlighting, taking money and not giving the brothel the cut. And they organised, or or somebody organised for a hit on her life and she was six foot under. And he used quite sort of blunt language like that, that she was six foot under, which I think was really hard for her parents. And Jan in particular, who who for many years still saw Ravel in her dreams and still, still thought of Ravel as her beautiful little dancing daughter, to hear somebody quite roughly say, oh, she had to be punished and she's, she's six foot under. And what sort of evidence did they have in the aftermath? Were any of her belongings found or were there any traces that were left in the days after her disappearance? Yes, indeed there were. She was wearing a pair of cork-heeled sandals and they were found in a rubbish bin not far from Gavin Samer's house, um, which was the last place she was known to be alive. And her keys were also found, so some of her belongings you could fairly say, were found strewn around the street. Now, some people will immediately jump to the assumption, well, maybe that happened. Maybe he, maybe they were flung out of Gavin's car or something as he drove away with the body. But it could equally be that she left his house and she was attacked in the street. We don't know, do we? We just, we just don't know. 
Um, but we do know that some of her belongings were found strewn in the street around Gavin Samer's house. Police found her handbag and in the handbag was a passport and the ticket to Japan, which is interesting and it's a clue as well that she did in fact intend to go to Japan because one of the other rumours that went around was that she had become, you know, she wanted to give up this life, she had become tired of this life, she was ashamed of this life and she wanted to disappear and start again, which occasionally happens, you know, people do give up their old life and try to start again under a new name for whatever reason, for a million different reasons. But we know that that was not the case with Ravel. She had a ticket to Japan. She had her passport ready. She was going to see her mum to have this lunch. She had talked to her friend about how excited she was. I, I don't feel that any of the clues point to her wanting to disappear. We are now boarding the roads. And there was enormous criticism of the police work done immediately afterwards, that there might have been some mistakes that were made. And you alluded earlier to sort of the history of sex workers um, and horrendous crimes that have been committed against them and investigations not potentially being thorough enough. Do you think that was a contributing factor in, in the mistakes that were made after Ravel's disappearance? Yes, I do. I do. Well, I think it's true to say that the fact that she worked in sex work had an impact on the fact that the case has not been solved, but not necessarily for the reasons that people think. I don't necessarily think that um, the police thought, oh, well, she's just a prostitute. We're not going to bother. I don't believe that. I know that that has been the case in the past. And sex workers themselves have complained about that, that, that cases of violence against them are not treated seriously because... It's almost like they put themselves in harm's way or that seems to be the feeling. What I feel happened here was that it wasn't necessarily unusual for Ravel to go off the radar for a little bit. I think one of the key things is when do you become a missing person? If you are a young child and you go missing, police will throw all the resources at it as quickly as they can because you're a young child. But Ravel was 22 years old and she was living independently in Sydney. She was a young woman. And and while it's true to say that she had missed a lunch with her mum and she had missed the train to Newcastle, I don't don't think that necessarily makes you a missing person. And and one of the problems that people have when they call the police and and they're very concerned about somebody they love is, you know, oh my goodness, my, my daughter wasn't on the train. She said she was going to be on the train and, you know, we were meant to have lunch. She would never miss lunch with me. From the from the police point of view, is that person a missing person or is that person somebody who's just missed their their lunch with their mum? That, that's it's a hard decision for the police because, as we know, hundreds of thousands of people go missing every year, and ninety eight percent of the time they're found. They're found, and it, and it's a really rare circumstance that somebody just gets snatched off the street or turns up having died violently at the hands of somebody that they don't know. So this is a rare crime now. It was a rare crime then. And one of the problems was, of course, that police weren't entirely sure what had happened in the earliest hours. And wasn't it the case, too, that her employer, when they spoke to the man and the woman who ran that particular agency, said that it wasn't entirely unusual for her to disappear or to be late for a shift. That was something that they'd experienced? Yes, that's right. So she was meant to see another client later that day, as we know. We know she made it to her four o'clock appointment and we know that she rang at six o'clock thereabouts to say that she was done and that her client, Gavin Samer, says she wasn't in fact done. She was going to stay on for a bit longer and earn some money on the side. But she was meant to be at another appointment at 7.30 that night. And it was an appointment that the two people who ran the escort agency didn't want her to miss. They described them as special clients. They were friends of the owner. They were of the same European background. And he and he liked to send Ravel to see these friends of his because she was particularly beautiful. He wanted to send somebody who was special and beautiful and gorgeous and all that kind of thing. So they really wanted her to go. And they had, in fact, told her 
don't miss this appointment. But then when, of course, she did miss that appointment, they would later tell the coronial inquiry, well, we just sent someone else because it wasn't unusual for Ravel to go missing, that she... I mean, she did work in the sex industry, but she didn't love it. She wasn't one of those people who says, you know, this is my passion. I've always wanted to work in the sex industry. We know that some women do feel that way. She would occasionally not turn up for clients. There were certain clients that she didn't want to see. She didn't want to see, he described in the coroner's court, he said, oh, well, she didn't want to see anyone who was old. She didn't want to see anyone who was ugly. She didn't want to see anyone who was poor. So it, it seems like it was not unusual for her to not turn up for that appointment, and then when she didn't turn up for the lunch with her mum the next day, that's when the alarm bells for her mum started ringing. But the police, of course, I, I think they have to make very serious decisions about when they declare someone a missing person. And did they give this a little bit more time because of the, the line of work that Rafael was in? Yeah, I think we can say that they probably did. And moving to the 1999 inquest, there was a testimony that her mother actually gave, um, she addressed to the court, and she referred to something that had happened to Ravel as a child, very young. What was that? Yes, Ravel had a younger brother, and there was an occasion when she was a very small child that she walked out outside the family home. The family was a very loving and beautiful family. The, the parents were terrific people. Um, her father's now died, of course, but um, there was an event in Ravel's childhood where she came upon her brother in the pool and I mean it's shattering isn't it it's a it's a shattering situation I don't know how much of the choices that Ravel made later on can be traced back to that kind of shocking incident I don't think we will ever know it's one of the things that has always intrigued me about the case, you know, the losses that some people are asked to bear, the impact of the experiences that we have as children on the choices we make later on. And also, I think in Ravel's case, the public response to her disappearance, I think in the main has been very loving and very warm. But there have been people who, or there has been in some of the commentary, a sense of this almost being an inevitable tragedy for this young woman. It's also a deeply human moment, I think, that, that centres, you know, the, the victim in this as someone who lived, even though she was so young, a complicated life and a full life, which included tragedy. And with that inquest, what were the final conclusions what did they determine probably happened to her it's it's undoubt it's 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 without question it's undoubted that that Ravel Balmain is dead she is dead she is lost to us and lost to her family and it, a, a young life taken in violent circumstances for sure the person responsible has never been found there was never enough uh, evidence to send anyone to trial now, the last person to see Ravel Balmain alive, we know, was the last client that she had, who was Gavin Samer. Um, he's still alive um, and he knows, he has told reporters that he, he realises that police regarded him for a very long time as a suspect. He lived in relative obscurity. He disappeared to Tasmania for about 15 years. And then just in the last two years, he's resurfaced in Sydney and he resurfaced in May of 2019 on assault charges. He was convicted of assaulting a woman. He was fined $1,500, he, he, and he's now appealing that. And then in February of this year, in February of 2020, he was charged with the sexual assault of a disabled woman, um, a woman who has uh, cognitive and physical disabilities. So he's still around. He has never been charged with the murder of Ravel Balmain. He has always denied having anything to do with it. And police would not appear to have any other leads. So the case remains unsolved. Thank you so much for your time, Caroline. We really appreciate it. Oh, and thank you again for your interest. To read Caroline Overington's reporting on the disappearance of Ravel Balmain, head to her website, www.carolineoverington.com or follow the link in the description of this episode. Caroline's books, both non-fiction and fiction, can be found at all good bookstores and online. 
As with every episode of this podcast, you can find additional information, photos and further reading on this case by joining our closed Facebook group. Just search for True Crime Conversations on Facebook. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted by me, Jessie Stevens, and produced by Elise Cooper. 